Welcome. I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Comedian Kevin James. He's known for playing bumbling average Joes, like a delivery driver on The King of Queens. He did that for nine seasons. And a security guard on a Segway in cult favorite Paul Blart, Mall Cop. But despite making it in Hollywood, the highly successful actor and stand-up comedian tells Jim Axelrod he doesn't really see himself as a leading man, but a lucky one. Even amidst all of this success, you were still Always. cranking in your head, this may not last. They're gonna find me out eventually. Well, that's my whole career. I think my whole career, you know, everything, every movie, you just go, they're gonna figure. If someone literally tapped me on the shoulder, God just said, hey, we know what's going on, right? I'd go, yep, where do I go? Where do I go? It's all up, all right. It was a fun run. Later in the show, Kevin James on his Amazon Prime special, Irregardless. So sometimes in the special we're all gonna see, for instance, there's some improv? Oh, oh yeah, not, not in the special that I shot. The, you know, when it's taped, it's, it's done. But the problem with the special when you're done, you're still doing that material a little bit and you, you improve it. You know, it's like, so it's like, oh, I write, I'm always rewriting bits that are already on, that's my biggest, I hate it. I, I do that with everything, with all my shows and movies too, it's like the same thing, I just keep editing it and it's like, let it go, it's gone. Then, abstract painter Mark Rothko. He's credited as one of the most important artists of the 20th century. Robert Costa explores an exhibit of some of Rothko's lesser known works on paper, on display at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. We can see his sources, we can see his early ambitions, his aspirations, and the way that he understands paper to be just as significant and important as his much better known canvases. Rothko on paper is equally as innovative, and he did not consider these to be studies or prep work. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. When an injury ended Kevin James's college football career, it set him on an unlikely path to stardom in Hollywood. Here's Jim Axelrod. Yes, <laughs> my car. You good? Yep. So this is where it all starts. This is it. For Kevin James. Oh, oh. The Q-tip. One of our most popular and successful comic actors of the last quarter century. Oh. All roads actually lead to stand-up. I see it, I say it, I see it, I say it. It's like a verbal wood chip. And right here on Long Island. This was the Eastside Comedy Club. First place I ever did stand up. I think I had a couple Coors Lights. Uh, <laughs> a couple? A couple to get the uh, courage up. And then uh, I went in here and this was the first place, 1989, July 26th. 35 years later, he has quite a lot to look back on. I love you, especially that part. Delivery man Doug Heffernan made him famous on King of Queens. Mall cop Paul Blart made him a bankable star. You like the stage. Yeah, I've been here many, many times. But it's still stand-up, like his new special Irregardless on Amazon Prime, that makes him happy. You ever try to delete an app? You gotta do that hard press on the phone, first of all. All the apps start shaking. They're I mean, a crazy journey, right? Yeah, it's amazing. And hopefully it's it still continues. Oh, they know somebody's going. They know this. A high school football star, James went off to play college ball at Cortland State in upstate New York. When a back injury ended his athletic dreams, a public speaking course sparked some new ones when he played it for laughs. So some light bulb went on. For sure. That I have this capacity. I have this talent. I didn't know what it was, but I had something. I don't know how you bottle it and make money off it, but I never went back to school. He went to work honing his style. Tell you what else annoys me, the size of muffins. How big are muffins gonna get before we all join hands? Affable and observational. Never dirty and always with an eye on the future. I just wanna lose enough weight so that my stomach doesn't jiggle when I brush my teeth. 
you don't work blue. You don't, you never have. No, because I knew it was going to prevent me from being able to get on a TV show. I want my act to be able to go and play wherever. It's like I want to build an act that people can relate to. By the mid-90s, James was big enough to bag an audition for Saturday Night Live. A chance to follow comedy legends like John Belushi, Bill Murray, Eddie Murphy. He fell flat on his face. It was the worst audition I've ever had in my entire life because it was, it was literally me in a room and they were filming and it was absolutely brutal. And I just started doing my stand up to no laughs, but I just kept going through it. Which is where you learn all you need to know about Kevin James, living proof that no one fails they just stop trying. Here's what I don't understand about that story. 99 out of 100 people would curl up in the fetal position and never move again. I just bombed a Saturday Night Live audition. Not you. It was the best thing that happened to me. <laughs> My eyes are getting weary. Losing out on SNL meant he was free to audition and win the lead in a pilot called The King of Queens. God. What, he's making fun of my shorts again. The bet Kevin James made on himself when he left college... He's five. Be the bigger man. <laughs> ...had paid off. It's frustrating, you know? He's so well-dressed, I can't come back at him with anything. Do you remember the moment of the phone call where you were thinking, my life has changed? Yeah, it's, you know, well, we got a call, you know, and it's like we're, we're moving on to the next level. In less than a decade, he'd gone from driving a forklift while moonlighting at Long Island comedy clubs to starring in a network sitcom. Just enjoy it. Enjoy who you are. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Too fast, perhaps, to completely trust the success. Even amidst all of this success, you were still Always. cranking in your head, this may not last. They're going to find me out eventually. Well, that's my whole career. I think my whole career, you know, everything, every movie, you just go, they're going to figure. If someone literally tapped me on the shoulder, God just said, hey, we know what's going on, right? I'd go, yep, where do I go? Where do I go? It's all up. All right. It was a fun run. Thank you. Everything hurts. Last week, I woke up, I asked my wife, I was like, hey, did I play rugby yesterday? <laughs> She's like, no, you shook a can of paint for me. <laughs> and it wasn't even a big can. I'm talking the little haagen size. But at 58, married for 20 years, Kevin James would now have a hard time making the case that it's not going to last. Maybe the only doubters now? His four kids. Do your kids think you're funny? They do at times. Are your kids lethargic? Because <laughs> I, I got a slug farm at my house. I really... They have really high taste, which kind of like stung me a little bit. Like, they really did. They were like, we get it. You're falling down in the mall cop thing, and it's, it's good. But we're looking for a little bit more, you know. I'm like, oh, all right. I'm going to give you my phone number in case you want to grab a drink sometime. I don't drink, but I do ride. <laughs> oh, no. But for all the success he found in Hollywood, this son of Long Island will never stray too far from his roots. Stand up sitcoms, movies. I say you're only allowed to do one for the rest of your career. What's it going to be? Stand up. It's just me and a mic, and, and I get to to do it and there's no process through the studio or the network of saying well we're gonna change it this way we're trying to cast this way and it's like you know I really do enjoy the process and there's gonna be times where this is not gonna work out the way you want and you're not gonna connect with people the way you expect you guys are the greatest God bless you all Come and there's other times where it's like yeah you can still do this this is great but the opportunity is there to do it and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that I'm grateful that I'm still here Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Jim Axelrod's chat with Kevin James. Something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. Stay with us. And it's like, I love how things are done and when I can see them. As promised, here's more of Jim Axelrod's interview with Kevin James. 
What's your process, though? How's the magic happen? I wish I could tell you. Um, it's, it's, it's trying a lot of you know, different things. And the problem is my consistency in, in writing every day. I just can't be one of those guys that just writes every day and just you know journals and all that. And I've never really been that way. Um, I like writing the most when I'm on stage, when I'm, when I'm up there performing and I feel like I, I have the audience, I have enough control over them where I'm going with my act and I know what I'm doing and I know there's, there's bits down there that are gonna be stronger and I can chance a little space here to try something new that if I lose them, I know I can go back and, and hit them with the, with the harder stuff. Wait, so sometimes in the special we're all gonna see, for instance, there's some improv? Oh, oh yeah, not, not in the special that I shot. The, you know, when it's taped, it's, it's done. But the problem with the special when you're done, you're still doing that material a little bit and you, you improve it. You know, it's like, so it's like, oh, I write, I'm always rewriting bits that are already on. That's my biggest, I hate it. I, I do that with everything, with all my shows and movies too. It's like the same thing. I just keep editing it and it's like, let it go, it's gone. So you got nine years yeah. between Eureka, mm -hmm. I found it, and hitting it. Right. What were those years like? Were you learning the craft? Everything, yes. Uh, I, I would go pretty much with my brother uh, and, and our buddy, and we would go pretty, uh, it would be once a week where there were, you know, uh, a, an open mic night uh, at, at a comedy club, you know, but um, then it was every night. You know, my brother was the one who was yelling at me. He's like, if you want to do this, because he, he, he would say, where are you tonight? And I go, I open mic night's not till next Tuesday, so I'm, I'm, I'm staying home, you know. And he goes, why are you staying home? And, you know, and I go, well, because I can't get up. He's like, you should get to the clubs. You should be watching. You should be, if you want to do this, you know, you never know what could happen if you go there. And he was right, you know. So I was like, all right. I, I went to the club and met someone who knew the local agents and stuff, and it was that kind of thing. And you kind of get a spot, and you talk to other bookers. And, oh, I have a room in Connecticut. And... And it kind of worked that way. And, uh, you know, it just grew. And once that started kicking in, uh, I, I just loved the whole world of it. I really mm -hmm. did. I loved writing during the day. You wake up very late, you know what I'm saying? It was like uh, 11 or noon, whatever you go. We would go to the club, the Eastside Comedy Club. We'd open it up and, and just write with a couple guys in there, mm -hmm. get a coffee in the club, and then that night we would put it up, and it was, it was so much fun, it was so great. And then you get to go around and tour with these guys and try to get into different, you know, different places. You strike me as, if you were a ball player, you'd love to sit around the dugout and talk about two-seamer, three-seamer, like how do you, where do you hold the bat? You love the craft. Yeah. I do, and yet I'm not organized in putting it together, but I do love talking about it, I do love you know, uh, they say the key to writing is the hiding of its conventions. And it's like, I love how things are done and when I can see them. Like, I'll, I'll go watch a stand-up and I'll be like, man, that guy's amazing. I'm not laughing anymore. You know, that's one of the things about being in stand-up. For so long, you can, you know, some jokes hit you and you just crack up and it just completely take you off guard. But other ones are really good, but you see the structure of the joke. You see how he's doing it. And I get interested, I'm very interested in that. I'm like, wow, that guy did it. He hit it so well and uh, just threw it away. And, it, you know, I, I love that because I'm still trying to work on that for myself. Do you feel comedians that rely on profanity that it's somehow an easier route to go? I, there are comedians that are very blue that I love, you know, that make me laugh, you know, really hard. So it's hard to say. It's not like I'm judging them. Um, it can be an easy way to get a punch, believe me, there's some jokes where I go, man, I just would love to just blast something Throwing in one the, Oh, <laughs> I would love it, just one, just for the shock alone. Um, but, you know, you still, an audience is gonna get tired of it, you know, e e you know, if that's all you're doing, you still have to work out, you know, you still have to get, get through it and design jokes, even if you're doing it, otherwise, the audience will get tired of it too. It, it becomes, it wears off. Do you tell your kids, I'm just curious, when, when you, your journey, from what you're explaining, was fueled by a passionate connection to what you were doing every day. Yeah. Do you tell your kids, whatever else you do, when you're making your own life choices, look for a passionate connection? A hundred percent. You know, there, you know, 
my daughters are looking for, you know, through co you know, colleges now and stuff like that. And they're, re they're so much smarter than I am, by the way. They really, they're so beyond me. Um, but, you know, and they, and they start panicking about what do I get? And I'm like, I wouldn't worry about any of that. Just really, it's, it's, you're so young right now. It's going to come. You know, it's, it's fine. You never know where it's going to come. Up next, abstract expressions on paper. Welcome back. Artist Mark Rothko, he's known for his abstract color-blocked paintings, but Rothko also created nearly 1,000 works on paper during his career, some of which he actually considered finished works, not just studies for compositions on canvas. Here's Robert Costa. His works are mesmerizing and recognized worldwide. Swaths of color, and floating fuzzy edged rectangles. All part of the signature vision of the formidable 20th century artist, Mark Rothko. Well, everybody knows and loves Rothko's large abstract canvases, but very few people know that he made nearly 3,000 works on paper. Now, an exhibit at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., hopes to tell a lesser-known Rothko story, the trail of paperworks the artist left behind. Adam Greenhouse is the curator. We can see his sources, we can see his early ambitions, his aspirations, and the way that he understands paper to be just as significant and important as his much better-known canvases. Rothko on paper is equally as innovative, and he did not consider these to be studies or prep work. When you look at these, they don't even seem like paper works, but this is paper. Yes, indeed. These are mounted in the way that Rothko insisted that his classic format paintings on paper be mounted. So they're attached to either a hard board panel or linen and wrapped around a stretcher or a strainer to give them this three-dimensional presence. Born Marcus Rothkovich in what is now Latvia, he immigrated to Portland, Oregon with his family in the early 1900s. He eventually moved to New York, working, teaching, and struggling, but also learning and evolving as an artist. Many of his early paperworks echo other visionaries and hint at what was to come. You can see the colors in the background, they remind me of an, a later Rothko. I think you're right. Some of these uh, sort of blocks of color in the background really point to the later abstractions to come. He sort of tried to keep a nine to five, nine to six schedule, tried to have dinner with the family every night. Kate Rothko Prezel is the artist's daughter. She says her father was a loving, hardworking man who anchored their family. He was also intense and private, especially when painting. I, as a smaller child, was fairly often uh, dropped off by my mother at the studio when she needed to get something done. And it was very clear that my father did, even for me at a young age, that my father did not like to be watched painting. He would always set me up in my own corner with my own artwork with the idea that I was going to be absorbed in my work, he was going to be absorbed in his work. It was for him this kind of uh, sacred, I think, deeply emotional and psychological process. Christopher Rothko is the artist's son. To be distracted during that was, was something that would be really so counterproductive. So that sort of mystery carries over to his materials. He was known for making a lot of his own paints, taking ground pigments and making his own homebrew. And part of the luminescence that we see and see in his work is the result of him constantly experimenting, trying to come up with the right concoction. I don't think those were secrets he was particularly guarding, but it was simply part of him making something was, that was very, very personal. That sense of intimacy, that emotional truth, is evident today for so many who experience Rothko's work. And with blockbuster exhibits in Paris and Washington. Maybe you're just supposed to experience it. And acclaim on television. You do feel something, right? It's like looking into something very deep. 
and at the auction house. And selling at $77,500,000. Rothko's popularity is soaring more than 50 years after his death. Christopher Rothko says his father sought to create a universal language, one that spoke to people's hearts. I often think about uh, going to a Rothko exhibition and it's a great place to be alone together. Ultimately, it's uh, a journey we all make ourselves, and, uh, but so much richer when we do it in, in the company of others. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.